All right. I would like to introduce Carrie Piper. She's going to be leading our presentation uh, for tonight's call about looking at self-esteem and children with hearing loss. And uh, Carrie, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and sharing a little bit more about yourself, and then also if you would like uh, folks to hang with their questions till the end, or if they can ask them at any time, that would be great. Absolutely. Thank you so much for calling in tonight. I don't think I'll have any trouble being loud enough for you, um, but I'm going to try to make sure I keep my talking at a nice low pace. I tend to be a fast talker. So thanks again for calling in tonight. Thanks to Carrie for asking me to speak. Uh, as Carrie said, I have been a parent guide. Um, I've been one for three years now with the Guide by program. And I'm able to do that because I was blessed with a little boy with a hearing loss. He's almost nine now and finishing the third grade, and I just learned so much from him. Uh, professionally, besides Guide by Your Side, I'm also a licensed clinical social worker, and I work in child welfare. So I hope to be able to bring a little bit of all sides of that to you guys. Um, do please hold your questions until the end. If you want to jot them down until then, that would be great. Uh, I will make sure to finish up to leave some time at the end all before we need to hang up and move on. I'll also provide you with my email address um, when I'm done speaking on this topic. That way, if you've got something that might be private or a little bit sensitive that you want to ask me about, please feel free to shoot me an email, and I'd be more than happy to try to help you with that. So I am going to go ahead and get started talking on our topic about self-esteem in children with hearing loss. So to start out, I'm just going to start out with that basic definition of self-esteem according to good old Webster's Dictionary. It's short and sweet, and it's just a confidence and satisfaction in oneself. The longer version of that is it's also a sense of personal worth and ability that's fundamental to an individual's identity. Family relationships during childhood are be believed to play a crucial role in its development, and parents may foster self-esteem by expressing affection and support for the child, as well as by helping the child set realistic goals for achievement instead of imposing unreachably high standards. We have a, a researcher who asserted that low self-esteem leads to the development of a personality that excessively craves approval and affection and extreme desire for personal achievement. Another theorist feels that in the theory of personality, low self-esteem leads people to strive to overcome their perceived inferiority and develop strengths or talents in compensation. So I could keep going on and get research facts and give you a series, but I know you called in tonight because you want some concrete tips and some suggestions for your own child or maybe that you're working with. Hopefully I can give you some of that tonight. Well, I was doing a little bit of research on this topic and, and preparing for tonight's presentation. I was reminded of a very simple fact and kind of had a little aha moment. I was starting to research the information on self-esteem as it relates to children with hearing loss specifically. And I was reminded that our kids are just like everyone else's kids to this topic. They just maybe can't hear as well or maybe communicate differently. So please keep that in mind tonight while you listen. Um, I will spend a lot of time focusing just on self-esteem in children and then I will touch base on how our children might be a little bit different in that area as well. So for those of us who are parents, there's a lot of pressure that comes along with our job. Not only are we expected to provide the basic needs like food and clothing and shelter, there's also a lot of pressure by society to keep up with the Joneses, whoever they are, for our kid to get into the best preschool, whatever that means, and for our children to have the coolest electronics or toys you add to that mix, we're also supposed to fulfill the simple little task of creating a safe world, teaching manners, and making sure our child grows up as a contributing member of society, set and achieve their goals, and move into adulthood as self-sufficient human beings that respect themselves and others. Sounds really easy, doesn't it? We have a tough job. Just a second here. Sorry, my, my notes went wonky. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is kind of break down um, the information kind of in, in age groups. I'm going to start with information with um, 
just starting from birth up to about toddler age, right before they're getting ready to, to start school. I'm going to focus on that first, and I'll move in and talk about grade school ages, and then move on to the preschool, or I'm sorry, preteen and, and teenage years at that point. Okay. So when we're talking about how children feel about themselves, that really does start from day one. Um, in, a, in a typical family situation, and I know there's a lot of family situations out there that aren't considered typical, um, this concept starts on day one. Baby is born and immediately is going to start that bonding and that relationship with their parents or, or their caregivers. And then we're going to add in relatives. We're going to add in maybe grandparents, siblings if they're there. Um, any other relatives that come into play. Um, so we're going to teach the children from, from day one who these people are in their life and when they have needs, that these are the people that are going to help, help them get those needs met. When we're looking at children this age, it's hard to see actual signs of what a healthy self-esteem is going to look like or a poor self-esteem is going to look like at those young ages of, of infancy and toddlerhood, they just don't show that to us. Um, so it really is our job to just do our best, try our best during that age just to make sure we're providing them everything that they do need at that young age. We want to make sure that we're helping them build that self-confidence, everything from um, learning to eat, knowing that we're going to be there to, to help them along with that process and, and depending on us and knowing they can depend on us, to so taking those first steps and knowing that if they stumble or if they fall, we're going to be there to help help pick them up along the way. When we're looking at kids that, that young age, even when we're looking at the um, children with hearing loss or children who have different communication needs, um, a lot of it comes down to helping build that self-esteem with them and giving them the confidence to, uh, to, to try new things and to try working on developing that language. So we're, what we're doing is providing them um, with that base knowledge at a very, very young age, providing that unconditional love, loving them no matter what. We're teaching them limits, and we're helping them, even when if they make a mistake, we're helping them learn from it and move forward and loving them no matter what. When we're moving on a little bit to the preschool age and to that grade school age, that's where things where we where we have a little bit more work to do. Um, we have so much to teach our children in in that time period, and a lot of it we just teach them naturally. Hopefully, again, we we're teaching them about respect. We're providing them encouragement. Um, we're making sure that they realize again if they do make a mistake, we're there to help them learn from it, and and help them know that mistakes are going to happen, and it doesn't make them a bad person. Um, it does even if they start having those bad feelings about themselves, uh, that we're there to encourage them, give it a try again, uh, that they're not a bad person, that it was just just a mistake that they made, and helping them learn from that. So we know that self-esteem can be a, a very fleeting experience. Sometimes we feel good about ourselves in one moment, and then the next moment we don't. Um, we, we have to teach our children that sometimes that's going to happen, and that's okay. It's just being you know, able to bounce back from that and have that resilience. Our goal as a parent is to make sure our child develops pride about themselves and self-respect, uh, faith in their ability to handle life's challenges. Um, we have a child who maybe at that young school age decides all of a sudden they want to try soccer. They've never played soccer on a team yet. They're six years old, let's say. And all the other kids on the team been playing they were right over the age of three years old. So they're experienced. And your six-year-old gets out there and if he doesn't have a whole lot of play time or misses that ball when it's passed to him, so that game's over, he's coming home and he's saying, you know what, I don't want to do that again. That was awful. I was terrible. I'm no good. It's really up to you as parents. I could go into the whole debate of do I let my child quit a sport or, or do I force them to continue on? That's, that's a different debate for a different time. So this is a perfect learning experience. Remind him that 
you know what, you made the choice. This was something that, a sport that you thought you would really enjoy and love, and, and you still have to learn. Um, encouraging them to practice extra, offering to practice with them, offering to get some of the teammates to come over and, uh, you know, set up practices with them so he can learn from them as well and, and giving it another shot, reminding them that, that nobody was great the first time they ever got out there and played. And maybe he's got a little bit of catching up to do, but, but he'll get there if he keeps trying. So you really want to encourage him and not let him just give up after that first try, like I said, especially if it is something that he really wanted to do and, and maybe came to you and asked to do it. So that's just that one example. And helping your children set goals at this age um, is important, too. <clears throat> when you're giving them that unconditional love, uh, the child's self-esteem flourishes with the kind of no-strings-attached devotion. We love them no matter what, no matter what they do. Um, but we need to remind them of that. Sometimes they worry that if I fail at this or I don't do very well at this, um, they may think to the extreme of, well, will mom still love me if I don't get an A on that test tomorrow? Or uh, will will my brother and sister still want to be my brother and sister if I don't, if, you know, enjoy that activity that they want me to do? So just reminding them, and it's a family, it's a family affair, remind them that unconditionally you're going to love them. You want them to, to try new things, and if they decide they don't like them, decide they don't enjoy them, that's, that's okay. We do that as adults as well. Something that I learned a long time ago, uh, just when I was getting started in social work, was to give those sandwich statements. And I don't know if any of you have ever heard of what a sandwich statement is, but it's something that I use often with many people in my life. So a stand sandwich statement example of that would be saying, I, I, I really like the way you do that picture. I, I don't appreciate that you used some of your marker on my dining table, but I think you did a great job coloring inside the lines on this area right here. So you're giving them a compliment. That's what you're starting out with in your attention because they want to hear that. Then maybe there's a little critique in there. So you're letting them know maybe what could be done better the next time. But then you follow it up with another compliment or, or more praise. So they're ending on a high note. I'm telling you, this works with everybody. Try it on your spouse. When they take the garbage out but maybe forget to empty it in a couple rooms, here's your sandwich statement. Thank you, honey, for taking out the garbage. Next time I hope you will remember to empty all the rooms but I really appreciate that you helped me with this store. <laughs> so it works on all ages. It's just important to make sure you're giving good detailed compliments as well. Um, it's nice to hear good job, job, good job, nice job, but eventually you're going to start tuning that, out, tuning that out, and it's just not going to mean so much. But instead, get excited. Whatever they did a good job on, Get excited and give them details. Tell them why you liked it, what specifically about it you enjoyed. Wow, I really like that you drew that picture. Even if I have no idea what it looks like or what it is, you did a great job using all those colors, and I really like this spot right here the best. Can we hang it up somewhere? That feels so much better to a child to hear other than, nice job. Paying attention to your child, and this, of course, can go with, with any age. We're all busy. Um, but making sure you're carving out time to give your child undivided attention. Something that I started doing with my child several years ago, um, and this is good to start at that preschool age, is asking them about their day. Something as, as simple and basic as that. You probably do that with the adults in your life. Do that with your children. Now, picking up your preschooler after three hours at school and asking them about their day, you're probably not going to get a whole lot of information. Um, asking that general question might not get you a whole lot of information. They might just say, it was fine. It was good. It was okay. You want details. So ask more open-ended questions. Ask them, uh, what we do is, is tell me one great thing about your day and tell me about one thing that wasn't so great. I don't like to ask good or bad. 
um, but one thing that was great or one thing that wasn't so great. And usually there can be a really long list of those, those great things. Sometimes it starts out with what they had for lunch or how many recesses they got. But if that's a great thing in your child's day, then, then wonderful. And, and listen to them when they're telling you that. Get excited with them. Then really, really pay attention when they tell you about something that wasn't so great about their day. They just want to be asked. There may be something that is bothering them, whether it's with a peer or maybe with a teacher or somebody else at school or maybe schoolwork. Um, and they just want to be asked. So asking them about that thing that wasn't so great may open up that conversation with your child. And again, that can be done at any age. And what became really, really exciting in our family is that my son now asked me um, something great about my day and something not so great about my day. And so it's really exciting to see him now have a genuine interest and on his own just, just come up and, and ask me that question. Now sometimes he doesn't really care what my answer is, but we're working on that part. So, you know, like I said, paying attention to your child. Um, I'll get into a little bit more about conversation skills and, and having those conversations in, in the preteen or teenage years, but that all carries through in, in all ages, making eye contact with them so they know you're really paying attention and listening. Put your cell phone away. Put the iPad away. Whatever it is, two, three minutes of your time is not too much to just, just give to your child, and they're going to feel so good about that and about themselves that you cared enough to give them your attention even though they know you're really busy. At the younger ages, it's really important to teach those limits to them as well. Establishing some reasonable rules but being consistent with those rules. If you're telling her to wear a helmet when she rides her bike in the driveway, don't let her go without it when she goes to her friend's house. And if she breaks the rule, be sure she knows what the consequence is beforehand. So letting her know, if you don't wear your helmet, you don't ride your bike. Knowing that there's a certain rule set in stone help her feel more secure. She knows what your expectations are, and she knows what the consequences are to those as well. And she also wants to show you that, that you can trust her and, and that you can expect her to do the right thing. And that's really going to build her up with her self-esteem as well. Supporting her and making some your child and making some healthy risks. Encouraging them to try something new. Um, doesn't mean they have to try every sport that's out there just to figure out what they're good at. Um, I'm guilty of, of doing that with my child at a young age as well, and I realized I was putting a lot more pressure on myself as well as on him, and now I just kind of let him take the lead. Um, as soon as he says there's something that he had fun doing or takes an interest in, I follow up with that. Do you want to do more? Or let's go outside and do that together. That shows that I am paying attention to what his interests are, and I, even if I'm not genuinely interested in what it is that he's doing, that I'm, I'm trying, I'm giving it an effort, and that makes him feel really good about himself. And letting those mistakes happen, again, at the younger age especially. Um, you know, you're letting them make those choices and taking those risks, and your child's bound to make a mistake. There's lessons to learn, and, and this is going to help build their confidence. Um, if your child misses a school bus, because they took too long eating, because they were staring at the TV, because this happens at my house almost every morning, encourage him to think about what he might do differently next time. Give him a consequence to that. The TV is going to get shut off at such and such time, whether you're done eating or not. You will continue eating, and that way you can make sure that you are ready for the bus. Celebrating positives. Again, that goes back to not just telling them good job or, or, or nice work, but being specific. Enhancing their sense of accomplishment and their self-worth to let them know exactly what they were doing well or what they did right. So I want to move on <clears throat> at this point while I'm still talking more on the younger ages and kind of talk a little bit about um, what are some signs of low self-esteem in younger ages so that we know what we can recognize and maybe in our own child um, as well as how we can handle some of that with things that we can do. I've touched on a little bit of that already, but I want to give you a little bit more. So when we're talking about those younger ages, <clears throat> excuse me, 
I'm going to pause and take a drink. We're talking about those younger ages, some signs to look for. And this might be a good time to take out a pencil and paper if you want to jot down a few things here. You have the child who avoids a task or a challenge without even trying, typically because they're afraid to fail or they have a sense of helplessness. Or you have a child who, who tries something but quits right after beginning, uh, giving up at the very first sign of, of frustration. <clears throat> Excuse me. The child that's cheating or lying when they think they're going to lose a game or do poorly. You see this a lot when they're interacting with other kids their age. Showing signs of regression, starting to act more baby-like or just very silly, thinking they're going to get attention. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this might get the wrong kind of attention. It might invite some teasing or name-calling from other kids their age. You may have a child that starts becoming very controlling and bossy, and I don't mean our two- and three-year-olds <laughs> that do that anyway. They're, they become inflexible, and that's just their way of trying to hide their feelings of, of being frustrated or feeling powerless. You might see this in some adults as well, and we recognize that as an insecurity. It's the same for children. We have a child who's making excuses. If the teacher is dumb or downplaying importance of events, saying, well, I didn't really like that game anyway, if they're losing. So they're using kind of a rationalization to, to blame others or, or blame the situation so they don't have to accept any responsibility for it. You may see grades starting to decline or losing interest in, in activities that he used to like. You may start withdrawing socially either losing or having less contact with his friends, may experience mood changes, uh, you know, sadness, crying or angry outbursts or frustration, or even just more quiet than usual, making real self-critical comments. Uh, just, just a reminder, Terry said at the beginning of the call, if you haven't pushed the mute on your button, Please go ahead and do that. That helps out all of us to be able to hear clearly. Thank you. So we're talking about child saying self-critical comments, like I can never do anything right. Nobody likes me. I'm ugly. It's my fault. Or everyone's smarter than I. They tend to get very dramatic with those statements. Pay attention to those. Difficulty accepting praise or criticism or becoming overly concerned or sensitive about other people's opinions about them, or being strongly affected by negative peer influence, starting to do what some of the uh, behaviors or, or adopting some of the attitudes of the kids who maybe are misbehaving at school, um, acting disrespectfully, stealing, and then even at this young age, grade school age, experimenting with smoking or, or alcohol or drugs. Um, so those are just some of the examples when you're looking at that younger school age children. Um, I'm talking before you hit that 11, 12 preteen age, although some of those will overlap, as, as you'll hear here soon. Some of those will overlap to the older ages too. But those are just some of the indicators that there just might be something going on or a child's not feeling so great about themselves, and it's time to, to start having those conversations with them. So at this point, I'll go ahead and move on to that preteen and, and fun teenage years that we know and we love. So when we're looking at, at these ages, a lot of what I, I already discussed is um, going to carry on into this age group as well. Um, probably the biggest thing that I can touch on when we're talking about that preteen and, and teenage age range that I mentioned before is the communication, the communication between primarily between the parent or the caregiver and that child, making sure you're talking with them, checking in with them about their day. Stop with the yes or no questions. Ask the open-ended questions. Um, don't settle for it was fine or it's good. Um, if they say they don't want to talk and they generally don't want to talk, revisit it later. Give them a break, give them some space, but come back and, and say, you know, hey, I'd really like to chat with you for a few minutes. I want to talk to you about my day, and then maybe you'll tell me a little bit about your day. I do want to give you a, a few facts 
about uh, teenagers and self-esteem that I found that I found the very last one to be the most interesting, but, but all of the numbers are good. So if you like numbers and statistics, here they come. So among high school students, 44% of girls and 15% of guys are attempting to lose weight. Over 70% of girls ages 15 to 17 avoid normal daily activities such as attending school when they feel bad about their looks. Over 70%, I said. More than 40% of boys in middle school and high school regularly exercise with the goal of increasing muscle mass. 75% of girls with low self-esteem reported engaging in negative activities like cutting, bullying, smoking, drinking, or disordered eating. So 75% of girls who have low self-esteem report in doing those activities. 25% of girls with high self-esteem report doing this, which seems like an awfully high number to me still. About 20% of teens will experience depression before they reach adulthood. Teen girls that have a negative view of themselves are four times more likely to take, in, take part in activities with boys that they've ended up regretting later. So here's the last one that I really want you to listen to. The top wish among all teen girls is for their parents to communicate better with them. I'm going to say it again. The top wish among all teen girls is for their parents to communicate better with them. This includes frequent and more open conversations. So it goes back to what I was talking about before, asking them about their day, not, not settling for the short answers, recognizing those signs in, in our teenagers. Um, a lot of those signs that I talked about before in the younger ages apply to those teenage years as well. Um, let me add, I'm going to add a few of those here. I just have to switch my page, sorry. So when we're looking at the size of, of low self-esteem in our teenage children or teenagers, adding to that list that I gave you before, paying attention to that child that's walking with their head down all the time. Uh, that's probably one of the most observable signs of low self-esteem. Think about it, not making eye contact, not really wanting anybody to see them or notice them. Sometimes this can be a physical expression of shame or embarrassment. They want to hide. They want to be unnoticed. Maybe they wear clothing that isn't going to stand out to anybody else, isn't going to draw attention to them. They don't make eye contact when they're talking to others. They assume people are going to think something negative about them and they're going to be able to read that on that person's face. They use negative I am statements. I am useless. I'm always getting it wrong. I could never do that. Or even as extreme as the world would be better without me. So some negative beliefs about themselves. Really, really pay attention when you hear your teenager saying things like that. Often involved in teasing or name calling or gossiping about others. Teenagers who feel bad about themselves are going to often seek to be negative about others. The defense mechanism takes the attention away from them, puts the focus on somebody else and what they may see is, is a negative quality about somebody else. That way, nobody pays attention to what they see as a negative quality about themselves trying to make themselves feel or look better by making somebody else feel or look worse. Engaging in inappropriate physical contact or avoiding physical contact, so one extreme or the other. A lot of teens who feel worthless or, or have low self-esteem um, really long for affirmation, and they may seek to find it physically. They desire for physical touch, sometimes sexually, from others. And that's just wanting that acceptance and wanting to feel connected. So if they're not feeling that at home or they're not feeling that with a peer group, they're going to look elsewhere for that. 
to the opposite of that, we've got the teens who don't like to be touched. They've got really strong feelings of, of disgust or shame about their bodies or, or how they may feel that they look or what, what, they, what their image represents. They may get really dramatic, and I mean more dramatic than your everyday teenager. Teenagers feel like they're not valuable or worthwhile, so they crave attention. One way to get attention is to act so people can notice you. They get loud. They may get into excessive bragging about themselves or their achievements or their appearance. They're trying to convince other people what they already don't feel about themselves. So trying to convince other people that they're better at A, B, or C or that they've accomplished A, B, or C. Trying to boost their own self-esteem that way. They may be avoiding social situations. And I mentioned this with the younger kids as well. Um, they may start to limit their friends or limit their activities with their friends. And teenagers who have very few friends or find it hard to make friends feel less confident about who they are and then less confident about being willing to build friendships, and that ends up a, a cycle. So those are some signs to look for in teenagers um, as far as the low self-esteem issues or any signs that they might be displaying. So all of those things can apply to kids of any ages, um, and all of those things can apply to kids of any ability. When we're talking about our kids who have a hearing loss and may, may communicate differently, um, we add in a few, few extras in there. I found some research on amplification and how that affects kids, um, especially in that school age, age child. So when we're talking about uh, kids who are, I found some, what the, sorry, the research that I found was on um, the use of amplification in the school system. And there was a big research project um, that they did on using the FM system. And what they found was kids who tend to have lower, um, less respect for themselves or lower self-esteem for themselves tend to not take advantage of that FM system at school. Um, they had various reasons for, for not wanting to use the, the FM and rejected it for different reasons. Um, one of those things that they said was talking about um, it makes you stand out. They don't want to stand out from their peers. You especially see this with kids who are mainstreamed. Um, they have other kids asking me, what is that? And that really frustrates some kids. Um, we can help with that by helping educate the staff and, and telling them that you know, we do have an expectation that they're in some way, whether it be us doing it for the child if they're younger or ha having the child help educate everybody on, on what the amplification is or uh, what the modality is, if they wear hearing aids or if they wear cochlear implants or Baja, whatever, whatever they use. Kids also say um, that sometimes their teacher forgets to use it and they're not comfortable reminding them. Or they think uh, it's a bother because they, they don't want to have to, they feel bad that the teacher has to wear it. They don't want to bother the teacher. So if the teacher forgets to put the microphone on, they may walk around with, um, their receivers on and, and never never give the microphone to the teacher because they don't want to bother the teacher. They feel bad that the teachers have to use it. So some of that is is social that you know they're feeling different from their peers, different from other kids that they might be in school in. And so one way to help with that is just again uh, starting at a very very young age, just educating your child about their hearing loss, educating about their differences but their similarities to other kids as well. Um, educating them on things that they're going to encounter as they get older. You may have the kids who get older and, and decide they absolutely hate their hearing aids. They don't want to wear them anymore. They want to be, quote, normal like the rest of their friends. Um, educating them that maybe what they don't realize is that by not wearing the hearing aids, they're going to miss out on some conversation. And so they're not really going to get to be a full part of that group that they really want to be a part of. So helping them feel more comfortable about whatever their difference may be, whether it's their communication needs or, or any amplification that they might use. 
So the last thing that I really want to touch on here, and then like I said, I'll open it up for any questions that you might have. Um, again, it's just reiterating that communication. Communicating with your child starting at that very young age, letting them know that you are interested in everything they have to say. I know most of you do that already. Um, it can't hurt any of us to step our game up a little bit. And then if you do start seeing those signs, because even if we're doing our very best job at home, we're not with our children all day at school, typically, in a, in, in a typical situation. Um, and there's going to be outside influence. There's going to be things that are going to affect their day and affect their thoughts. And so just communicating with them, always leaving that door open for them to be able to, to talk and give them your undivided attention, showing them the same respect that you want them to, to have for themselves and to show everybody else in their, in their world as well. And hopefully when they're 18, somebody's going to come up with this plaque and they're going to give it to all of us parents to tell us we've done a job well done as well. So that's all I have for you on this subject tonight. I will open it up to questions. Um, as I did say, if you have any questions specific to your child, but you don't feel comfortable asking me the question, let me give you my email address now. It's all lowercase, and it's H-I-S-L-I-L-M-A. So that's his little ma at yahoo.com. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that way as well. But if you have any questions now, I'm more than happy to open up the floor. I hope you're still awake and with me. <laughs> Anyone? Are you still there? This is Carrie. You're not alone. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is Heather Gibson. I'm still here. Hi, Heather. Hey, this is Laura. Okay. I have a question. I'm not a parent, um, yeah. so I wanted the parents the first chance to ask questions, but I have a question. Go for it. Um, I work with a child. He's one year old, and um, he wears a cochlear device. He had implant surgery. Um, I'm looking for um, maybe some techniques on how to better understand him. Um, his parents and I are taking sign language classes, and I sign in the home with him. I'm, I'm his nanny. I'm with him all day long, um, five days a week. But I feel like he is communicating so much more than I'm understanding, and I'm looking for tips on how to read him better, I guess. I think that is so great that you took part in this call tonight. Thank you for that. Oh. Um, do you get to take part in any therapies that he may be participating in with early intervention or anything like that? Um, I'm involved with all of them. Beautiful. That's going to be your best way to learn. Ask the therapist for, for tips and suggestions, things that different homework ideas that you can work on um, when they're not there. Mm -hmm. um, you're the one that's with him most of those waking hours of the day. Um, and so understandably, you want to be sure that the communication is, is, is going both directions, but they will probably be the best teachers for you to be able to give you suggestions and tips um, not knowing that child and where he is communication-wide, I, I would be really hard for me to to say, um, you know, give you any tips or suggestions. But that's I would refer you to them, and just let them know what else can I be doing when you guys aren't here to to help me be able to communicate with him better. So there's no there's no special way to like better communicate with a child with a hearing loss. Like I I feel like I, when I was speaking with one of his therapists. I asked her to um, kind of go through what she is here, like what she's watching him and seeing him communicate to her, and it was different than what I was seeing. So, okay. uh, like just in his movements and things, and I'm just learning how to really detect baby sign and things like that. So, um, more so like tips on how, I guess, how to better pay attention so that I'm so I'm really engaged in, in, in listening to him in everything that he's expressing. No? There aren't any black and white tips um, okay. per se because every child's different and every child with a cochlear implant is different. Their progression is going to be at their own pace. Um, so the expressive language is going to be at their own pace. I, I wish I had better answers for that. Um, <laughs> Like the mom looking for the manual type deal. <laughs> There's no well, manual. 
front pages there's of the organization. <laughs> there's really not. Maybe there's somebody else on the call that, that can, you know, help refer you better than I can. Um, but, but, yeah, I mean, I, I would just say continue doing what you're doing as far as being involved in therapies and mm -hmm. just asking them for any other suggestions or tips. So it, is it just you and him during the day, or do you have other children that you watch, too? Um, three days a week we have his sister. Okay. So for she the most part, you'll, you'll, you get to focus all that attention on him. And so that's really going to be the best way. You're just going to learn from him, really. He's going to be your manual. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Hi, this is Heather Miller. I have a question regarding some of the things you were saying with kids that if they're playing a game and they, you know, they get really negative about it or they start to, yeah. you know, tell mistruths. Do, do you have suggestions on how to redirect their um, behavior to make it a more positive experience to try to alleviate that behavior? I do. Um, it's going to depend on the age. Um, in some circumstances, it's going to be something you're going to want to redirect right away. Um, in other circumstances, it may be a conversation that's worth being held in private afterwards. Um, and that would be good for maybe a little bit of an older child, um, just refreshing their memory. Hey, I was watching you while you were playing that game with Johnny, and I noticed that you, whatever it was, um, and, and this is what you said. Why? Tell me why you said that and just getting them to think about it, getting them to explain why. Um, if it's in the moment, um, you know, you don't want to only say, which, you know, it's probably typical for a parent to just jump right in and say, oh, no, 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 you know, we're not, we don't want to say that, or, or you know, don't say that about yourself. Um, give them reasons why. You know, let them know, oh, goodness, you, you, you can be better at that, you know, you are better at that game. I've seen you do a great job. That That's nonsense, you know. And, again, it's going to depend on the age of the child that we're talking about. It's going to be much different in that two-, three-, four-year-old versus the, you know, seven- or eight-year-old even. Does that, that help a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. You're welcome. Anyone else? Hi, this is Anita. I have a I'd like to say something. Hi, Anita. Hi, I wanted to share with a comment about a uh, child the child with the com the cochlear implant that was learning to sign. Does that mean uh uh are the parents trying to get a res better receptive skills of the child's sign language? Uh what I wanted to say was for example, a child uh, from a very young age can uh, have some hearing, but maybe when they're vocalizing, that hasn't yet uh, developed enough to match the sound. But really, it takes. It's the same for the parents. It's the same as you know a child trying to sign and creating new signs, and and a baby you know trying to speak and speaks differently. It's. I don't think that it's wrong, and it really depends on. The, the child individually, what they're developing as, you know, their signs aren't going to be perfect, their voice isn't going to be perfect. Uh, it's the same as regular children just as they develop. So I thought maybe a comment might help just to put it in perspective for you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Comment. Sure. Thank you, Anita. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you all for participating tonight. Um, at this time, I do not have a call set up for May, and I'm fairly certain we're not going to have a call June and July. Typically, we're all running in different directions during the summer months and family vacations, and kids get to bed maybe a little bit later because of um, being out of school. Um, and actually, I'm expecting um, my fourth child in June, so I'll be on maternity leave for a little bit. There will still be someone at the helm. Andrea is going to be um, running the ship while I'm gone. Um, but uh, as far as the extra calls, I think those two months for sure will be up. 
So if um, we do get a call coordinated for May, that will be posted on our Facebook page and, of course, um, shared with you through um, flyers and such. And um, then we're looking at some topics for the fall relating to um, transitioning and so forth. So um, thank you all for being on the call. Thank you, Carrie, so much for um, sharing with us more about self-esteem and strategies with working with our children and, and really help boosting them and, and keeping them um, feeling good about themselves. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. All right, everyone, have a great night. Again, if you need the recording, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, and if you know somebody that might like the recording, please send them my way. Thank you all. Have a great night.